their analyst focus list in terms of computer networking and hardware companies. Now, they still maintain an overweight rating and a $210 price target, but they think that the near-term upside may moderate. They're going to look for a little bit more clarity with regard to not just consumer spending. We'll see some signs of that in the jobs report today. And then maybe possible moderating business commercial spending down the line. So a lot of that driving it, but again, still buy rated, if you will, there. Also, Chinese internet stocks, very much a big focus this morning for a lot of traders and investors because we are seeing Pin Duo Duo, Baidu, NetEase, JD.com, the four biggest Chinese internet stocks listed in the U.S. within the NASDAQ 100, all up very large between 5 and 12 percent. This is the reason why. Reports over at Bloomberg say that Chinese regulators may be considering giving full access to company audits over here in the U.S. for those U.S. listed Chinese companies. That's driving a little bit of that optimism. Of course, all of those reports are citing sources familiar not authorized to speak publicly. Nonetheless, it's driving sentiment, but I will point out for context, Andrew, because we love doing that on this show and on this network. Over the last couple of years, these Chinese internet stocks have taken a massive beating. If you take a look at a two-year chart of the K-Web, which is the big internet ETF that tracks many of these Chinese internet names, from the highs that we saw back in 2021, we are still down roughly 73% off those highs. So again, Chinese internet, big surge today, We'll see whether or not it gets, kind of shifts the momentum over there for that most decidedly downward trend in those stocks. Andrew, back over to you. Okay, Dom, uh, at the Domino, we're going to keep our eyes on those Chinese stocks and Apple. I'm fascinated by that one as well. Joe, over to you. Okay, thanks. We're less than 90 minutes now from the release of the March employment report. And Steve Leisman rejoins us now with a preview. Hi, Steve. Hey, good morning, Joe. Yeah, despite the uh, surge in oil prices and other inflation of Fed raising rates and economic uncertainty around the war in Ukraine. Well, Wall Street's still looking for yet another strong jobs report that would maintain average monthly job growth at an historic half a million a month. We're looking for four to 90,000 this morning. That's after 678 last month. Unemployment rate dipping down at 3.7%. That would be nearly a 50 year low. Uh, one, of the, sorry, one of the three lowest in the last 50 years. Average hourly wage has seen a strong 0.4%. What are we looking for? Well, a rebound in hospitality. We saw that in the high frequency data, along with uh, in the ADP data. Concerns, of course, by the Federal Reserve about wage push inflation. Wages go up, prices go up, prices go up, wages go up. And we're looking for workers returning. The participation rate, Morgan Stanley writing, we continue to expect labor force participation will increase over time as the strong demand for workers draws people back into the labor force. Worth pointing out, despite the robust forecast from the street, High frequency data is a bit soft, and one economist, our friend Ian Shepherdson at Pantheon, says it's enough to make him think there could be no job growth in March at all. That's the other side of the story. And that would surprise a lot of folks, but maybe the Fed would be quietly pleased at that as it would take some pressure off wages and eventually inflation, Joe. That's what we're looking for. All right, Steve, we're, uh, we will be talking about it and watching for it. And then once it comes out, get ready. And, and try and do it really fast, Steve. Uh, I, I want you to like write down everything. You, you get all your thoughts all in order and squared away for the most salient feature. You've done that already, I, I assume. You usually do, right? You know exactly what you're looking for. Um, I know what I'm looking for. I don't know what it's going to say, though. But, you know, you got to adjust with what the data is. And one very quick thing, Joe, I know with the music's playing and everything, nobody has a good bead on telling what's going to happen. No particular data series and no forecaster in this uh, pandemic has done a good job. In fact, everybody has done a really lousy job at forecasting it. So any number would not really surprise me. But it, I think what Michelle Gerard said was really interesting. You could have a lousy number because there just aren't people to hire. It's a supply issue at this point, not the demand, right? And you could have a lousy number and three months later, they come back and revise it and it's a great number like it did with November. Right. All right. Thanks, Steve. Coming up, uh, President Biden announcing an unprecedented release of oil from U.S. reserves in a push to lower prices. We're going to talk more about uh, that push and the uh, trying to achieve uh, energy independence at the same time as we transition. Plus, uh, those March jobs numbers are due at 8.30. We'll bring you the report and the instant reaction as soon as it hits. Stay tuned. Squawk Box will be right back.
This is a wartime bridge to increase oil supply until production ramps up later this year. And it is by far the largest release of our, net, of our national reserve in our history. It will provide historic amount of supply for a historic amount of time, a six-month bridge to the fall. And we'll use the revenue from selling the oil now to restock the Strategic Petroleum Reserve when prices are lower. President Biden uh, yesterday announcing the release uh, of a million barrels a day from the Strategic uh, Oil Reserve to help cut gas prices and fight inflation. Joining us now is Joe Croft, CEO of Alliance uh, Resource Partners. Uh, and it's Kraft, really, Joe, sorry. Uh, and, and Joe, right. describe what Alliance does. It, it, how much is coal, how much is uh, natural gas and oil at this point? So we uh, produce coal. We're the second largest producer in the eastern United States. We also own significant oil and gas minerals uh, that we lease to the EMP companies. Uh, we're primarily, uh, our, our profits are probably uh, 70, 80 percent coal and 20 percent uh, related to the oil and gas segment. Joe, the, the all-in notion of, of supplying energy and, and energy independence, does it still include coal? And can it be, can you include coal? Uh, and does it need to be clean coal? Is it still part of the equation? Because, I mean, we've heard politicians running for president say, I'm going to put the coal industry out of business completely. So that, that's the backdrop that you're dealing with right now, isn't it? Uh, that's correct, Joe. Uh, in the energy crisis back in the 70s, the nation turned to coal. Uh, this time with the energy crisis, you've heard a lot about increasing oil and gas production. You've, er you've heard about policies trying to uh, ship uh, natural gas or LNG to Europe, but you don't hear anybody on the uh, federal policy arena talk about coal, and that's a major mistake because coal is the one reliable, resilient power source we have in this country. And we need to continue to, to depend on coal. The, uh, talk about the, the composition of the coal that you do produce. How much of it is, is what we think of it as clean coal? And, and would, would it make more sense to replace the coal that's being used now with, with natural gas? Can that be done to power the grid? Or are we going to be using coal for years into the future? Well, specifically on whether it's clean coal or coal, I mean, all the coal that we sell into the thermal plants are going to plants that are totally compliant with all environmental laws today. And I think one of the major misconceptions on emissions, when people want to look at the emissions, they like, you know, when you think about trying to replace a coal-fired generator, uh, what are you going to replace it with? You're going to replace it with either renewables, which require natural gas as a backup. So that's three different energy sources. What we're talking about is just protecting the fleet where power plants have already been invested in, no new investment, no new energy activity. Instead, we've got an administration that is passing rules that are threatening 25% of our coal fleets in 2023. There's a specific regulation uh, dealing with coal ash, which is uh, basically the storage of a coal byproduct after uh, the power plant uh, uh, burns the coal to generate electricity. Under the Obama administration, they passed a rule uh, complying a different technique uh, to store that ash by 2023. Unfortunately, the backup power uh, has not been there uh, to allow those coal plants to close. So we have roughly 55 different uh, power plants that are currently trying to get an extension on that timeline because they're really concerned about an energy security issue next year. When you think about emissions just from those coal plants they're trying to close, you're trying to replace that with not only new capacity for solar, wind, and natural gas, but also the infrastructure for that. That means pipelines and transmission lines. You can't convince me that when you ca capture all the emissions from all three of those industries, plus transportation and pipeline, that they're greater than the existing power plants they're trying to close. It, in India and China, uh, it, it, what we read, the, the anecdotal evidence, is, is coal usage, coal production soaring, and, and how, how would you characterize the regulatory constraints that you have with coal versus what we think of with, with just natural gas and, and oil? It must be much more uh, prohibitive uh, for you trying to do business at, at this point. But is the rest of the world cranking out the coal and, and, and burning it for power? Yeah, there's no question. China 
most recently chairman chi went to the coal producing regions and said we have no oil we have no gas renewables are unreliable we are depending on coal we are going to continue to rely on coal they will state that they have uh, zero emission or they want to make some dent in their emissions policies but they've extended that up to 2060 our country wants to talk about 2030. Uh, India, same thing. They want to grow their economy. They want to take care of their people. They want. They know that coal is the lowest cost energy source to lift their people from poverty. So those two countries are going to continue uh, to rely on coal uh, to build uh, the future for their people, and they will continue to do that even more if we move move away from coal because we will be a higher cost uh, competitor. Now, specific, specifically to your question on regulations, our biggest problem is largely because when the administration says they want to put us out of business, guess who listens to that? That's our banks. Our banks listen to that. Our customers listen to that. And therefore, their policies speed up the uh, demise, the lack of, of support for our industry so that they define a transition period that is totally inconsistent with what even the president says he wants to do and in recognizing that they need coal until 2035 to be able to meet the energy security needs of our country. So when you have a bank that says they're not gonna lend to us because we're in the coal business because of discriminatory practices, that makes it far harder for us to compete and provide low cost stable uh, uh, energy to fuel our economy. Well, all right, uh, it, it is complicated and I, I can't imagine trying to, to it's hard for oil and gas companies. For coal, we, that's almost a forgotten energy usage in, in the United States right now. But obviously, if we didn't have it, I'm, I'm not sure uh, it's, it's, we can replace it as quickly as, as people think we can. And, and overall, you, you think the regulatory environment is affecting our ability to, to be independent, an independent country for energy? There's no doubt about it. If the president and or the administration do not put a pause to this clean, uh, to, to the CCR regulations, we're going to see a serious issue in our country. We're talking about enough electricity that would fuel uh, both Indiana and Ohio. You think about blacking out those two states because we shut down 25% of our coal fleet next year. Inflation and energy security are going to suffer. And you listen to what Joe Biden said yesterday when he invoked uh, the National Production uh, Act to say we need more minerals because he doesn't want to depend on China. So we're moving away from one commodity source that has served this country well for the last 40 years. And we're putting our fate in the hands of the Chinese Communist Party. What have we learned from watching Russia? invade Ukraine and see what that does for Europe's put their fate in the hands of Russia. Why are we going to put our fate in the hands of China? All right. Mr. Kraft, thank you. The CEO of Alliance uh, Resource Partners. Good to have you on this morning. Good luck. Thanks. Direct me on. Thank you. All right. Okay, coming up, uh, your corporate headlines, we're going to bring them to you. And then where have the IPOs gone? Well, that is the question. The number of companies going public falling off a cliff so far this year. We've got a special report about it. Before we head to a break, let's get a check on the markets ahead of the March jobs data. You're looking at the Dow, looking like it would open up about 210 points higher. NASDAQ up about 95 points. The S&P 500 up about 27 points. But, of course, all that could change when we get that number at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Market watchers and, of course, the Fed will be watching. Squawk returning after this.
Welcome back to Squawk Box, everybody. In our headlines this morning, we are a little over an hour away from the March jobs report. Economists are looking for 490,000 new non-farm jobs for the month. The unemployment rate is expected to fall to 3.7 percent. That would be down from February's 3.8 percent. The votes are still being counted at two union elections at Amazon warehouses. At this point, workers in Amazon's Staten Island warehouse are leaning in favor of union representation, while employees at a warehouse in Alabama appear to be set to vote that, down, to vote that idea down for the second time. And lawmakers are near a deal to approve $10 billion in new funding for efforts to battle COVID-19. Utah Republican Senator Mitt Romney, who, helped, who has helped lead the negotiations, says that an agreement has been reached in principle. The money would be used to buy vaccines, treatments, and COVID tests. When we come back, the number of companies going public falling off a cliff so far in 2022. Just 17 companies have made their debut. We've got a breakdown of what's going on. That's next. And later, the president's plan to tax the wealthy, drawing skepticism on both sides of the aisle. We'll debate this issue of taxing unrealized gains. Squawk Box will be right back. Time now for today's AFLAC trivia question. The New York Biscuit Company merged with the American Biscuit Company in 1898 to form what cookie company? The answer when CNBC Squawk Box continues. Now the answer to today's AFLAC trivia question. The New York Biscuit Company merged with the American Biscuit Company in 1898 to form what cookie company? The answer, Nabisco. The maker of Oreo, Chips Ahoy, and other brands is currently owned by Mondelez International. The first quarter has come to a close, and so far in 2022, the IPO pipeline has come to a near standstill. Leslie Picker uh, joins us now with more. Hey, Leslie. 
Hey, Joe. Yeah, the IPO market has essentially fallen off a cliff so far this year. Just $2.4 billion worth of listings have hit U.S. exchanges in 2022. That's 5%, just 5% of the volume that we saw last year over this same period. That according to DealLogic data. In fact, this has been the worst three-month stretch for IPOs in 24 quarters since the beginning of 2016 when the prospect of rising interest rates ensnared uh, ensnared broader markets. It's not too dissimilar to what's going on now. Higher rates whipsawing the profitless growth companies that have come to epitomize the IPO market in the last few years. The Renaissance IPO ETF is more than 20% lower this year. Geopolitical and pandemic uncertainty also creating headwinds for supply chains and inflation potentially creeping into margins of companies otherwise looking to go public, looking to debut. All of that creates opacity for how to value and trade new issues, so companies that can wait to go public are choosing to do so. Chobani, for example, was set to make its debut earlier this year and has delayed. Reddit was planning on, go on going public in March. Well, that didn't happen. It's April now. Digital bank Chime is reportedly punting its deal to the second half of the year. Instacart and Stripe were considered candidates for this year as well, but they just had their valuations slashed by Fidelity. So. The IPO market may remain practically at a standstill until something changes on the macro front. Guys. Okay. Uh, meantime, I uh, want to talk about this. The Wall Street Journal reporting the Justice Department and SEC investigating trading activity in Activision Blizzard, head of the company agreeing to be acquired by Microsoft. Steve Kovac joins us now with more. Steve. Andrew, um, I heard a little bit more from the Bobby Kotick side of the, this issue uh, about that brunch you guys were talking about last hour. So um, I'll just tell you what uh, his uh, spokesperson, Mark Kerr, told me last night. Um, quote, Mr. Kotick had a social brunch with his friends at a popular restaurant. He, of course, didn't share any information with them regarding a possible transaction with Microsoft. So, Andrew, kind of making this sound like a social thing among friends. Of course, as you guys were talking about earlier, who knows what was actually said or other signals that could have been sent. Um, but, of course, we know how uh, Barry Diller is framing this and saying, you know, everything's above board and, and things like that, Andrew. I think the real question at this point is there's going to be evidence that's going to be brought to bear in terms of either emails and other and, and other documentation. Barry Diller has publicly said that they're turning that over and he believes that that effectively exonerates them, uh, explains the story as a coincidence, suggests that uh, I believe that David Geffen uh, perhaps had a view, uh, as did others in the marketplace at the time, that either a buyout of the company or potentially a take private uh, was possible. Of course, you know, whether there are, I mean, there's, there's two issues when it comes to insider trading that are fascinating. You know, the tipper and the tip E become, you know, typically for insider trading to happen in, in, a, in a meaningful way, though I think actually there's examples of it in different contexts. Uh, you know, what Bobby uh, Kodak said or didn't say um, may in some ways be irrelevant uh, or could be relevant. Typically, there, there's supposed to be some kind of transfer, not just of information, uh, but effectively compensation for the information. So right. if, if you got some kind of sign or you thought you got a sign, what does that really mean, right? And I think this is the kind of thing we're going to learn a lot more about uh, as, as this plays out. Yeah, and Andrew, just also look, I mean, they were looking at the same public data that everyone else was. You know, Berkshire uh, Hathaway invested a ton into Activision. And Microsoft, of course, saw the stock falling because of all these cultural issues within the company, smelled blood in the water, and realized they can get this really good company on the cheap because of all these problems. So it's very possible uh, these three men, you know, saw the same data that Berkshire Hathaway saw, that Microsoft saw, and said, hey, this is an opportunity. This is an acquisition target. We know the gaming industry is going through a lot of M&A right now, and it's going to heat up even more. So, I mean... Yeah, and plus they bought these options, I think it was at 40 bucks a share, so they were already in the money uh, from the get-go. Andrew? Uh, so in terms of timeline at this point, what, what is the expectation of how fast uh, this either gets resolved or not? Yeah, well, that's, that's a real question because th this is just a probe right now that the WSA is reporting, so nothing you know, too formal is going on. And at the same time, th there, there are two things happening right now with the Activision thing. There's, there's this issue, this probe that we're talking about now, and then there's the settlement earlier this week with the EEOC where Activision made this 
$18 million fund for claimants of sexual harassment and misconduct and so forth can come forward and make their claim and, and be awarded from this, this fund. But at the same time, some employees don't think that's enough and, and they're filing separate lawsuits. Um, in fact, there are eight women. I spoke with the lawyer, Lisa Bloom, earlier this week. Uh, she's representing at least eight women in separate cases against the company. So you really have Kodak kind of getting it from two different sides with this SEC probe and then these culture issues that are still plaguing the company and the lawsuits to follow. Hey, hey Andrew, I'll, I'll, I'll ask you and Steve both this really quickly. Uh, just the idea that I was kind of playing off what you were suggesting. If, if, if it's the onus isn't on Bobby Kodak necessarily in terms of what information he would have given in that, that right. means if that's the case, if he's not in trouble for saying anything, then the pressure would be really high on him. If they're going to come in and ask what happened, he'd have no reason not to tell the absolute truth because that would be the only thing that would get him in trouble. If he testifies that he didn't tell them right. that, I would think that that would be pretty strong. Yeah, evidence. the last thing you want to do is lie to, right. <laughs> to these people. and that, right. That'll get you in trouble even if you did nothing wrong uh, as far as insider on the insider trading front. Yeah, absolutely, Becky. Steve, we're going to leave the conversation there. Uh, we will continue uh, to follow uh, this saga uh, as it unfolds. Appreciate it. Thanks, guys. Bex? Mm -hmm. Thanks, Andrew. When, when we come back, President Biden's proposed wealth tax causing controversy on both sides. We will debate that plan next. Plus, the March jobs report out in just under an hour. The futures ahead of the number looking pretty strong. Dow futures indicated up by just over 200 points. The Nasdaq up by about 100. S&P futures up by 26. Stay tuned. You're watching Squawk Box, and this is CNBC. President Biden's proposed tax on unrealized gains of wealthy Americans has stirred some heated conversation on her own set and across the country. Joining us right now is Preston Brashers, the senior policy analyst at the Heritage Foundation Herman Center. Also, Tobin Marcus, who is senior U.S. politics and policy strategist at Evercore ISI. 
Um, gentlemen, this is a stirred up debate, I think, on both sides of the aisle, just the idea of going after unrealized gains. But I, I think the people who are more presenting a stronger case against this have to be on the right. So, Preston, why don't we start with you? What, what is it about going after unrealized gains that you don't like? Well, the fact is you're going after money that income that has not been earned yet. So the fact that um, it, I think it's telling that this administration, in order to pay for all the uh, goodies that they want to have, they're effectively going after money that doesn't exist yet. So unrealized capital gains, you know, for most people, if they have a, a house or a stock portfolio, um, if, if, if that gains in, in value in any one year, um, you're not going to be taxed on that until you sell that asset. And that's, that's the way it works, uh, not just in the U.S., but in, in economies around the world. And uh, ultimately, if you start taxing uh, unrealized capital gains, it's very problematic because what you're doing is you're making it very hard for dollars to go to the, uh, the, uh, the uses that they're most productive in. So that's what the, what the economy is, that's what finance is doing, is, is it's allowing um, uh, investors to decide where they want to spend their money. And what is, what is going to happen when we start taxing unrealized capital gains is, is that the, this, this whole um, system is, is going to break down because now instead of making a decision based off of um, the best um, the best return on investment, but we're going to start to make that decision based off of how we can avoid this, this new tax that they're imposing. Hey, Tobin, I, th I think that's the biggest problem with this. this. This isn't even an income tax. There's going to be a battle in the courts about whether you can even do this. So if you're serious at wanting to get at ways to tax uh, the wealthiest Americans, I mean, this just seems like a non-starter. It seems a little silly. The idea of taxing unrealized gains is is a big stretch. And I'm not even sure. I'm, in fact, I'm fairly certain the Democrats aren't even going to be able to get convince all of their senators to vote for this. What, what do you say about it? I agree that it's not going to pass Congress. And let me circle back to the legal question. But just to clarify about the proposal, first of all, this is applying to income uh, of people over $100 million in, in assets. So the cases of an individual with a stock portfolio or someone with a single family home, I think those are pretty firmly out of uh, out of the range here. And they have for been now. For, now, <laughs> for now, sure. But the idea of taxing unrealized gains is a brand new one with something we've never done before. And every tax that's ever been imposed eventually winds up hitting everybody. I think that's right. But, you know, to the extent that one is uh, concerned about disincentive effects, to the extent that we're concerned about it, distortion, there is a pretty strong distortionary impact right now of the incredibly strong tax incentive to hold gains for, or to hold assets for a very long time. I think one of the things from a tax policy perspective that the administration is, is concerned about here is trying to actually, you know, unlock some of the capital that's being held for a really long time. And I think they've been fairly thoughtful about putting in exceptions for, for example, founders of companies to try and make sure that the illiquidity of their holdings isn't forcing them to sell out of their ownership stakes uh, earlier than they need to. So I think it's a fairly thoughtful proposal. I don't think it's going anywhere. I think it's pretty clear that there's no uh, support from Democrats to get this through Congress. I think this is essentially uh, an attempt by the Biden administration to inject this idea into the conversation to get debates like the ones that we're having going so we can work out what the kinks are, figure out whether this is viable long term. I think it's more thoughtful than previous efforts to tax either unearned uh, or unrealized gains or wealth. Um, and, and I think and the fact that they I just go back to one thing you just said, the idea that the administration wants to unlock power and convince people not to hold assets over a long period of time, hold investments over a long period of time. I mean, that's that's nuts because it's arguing against com compound interest, which is the best way to build wealth for, for the average well, investor, the for, people, for the wealthiest investors, no matter how you do it. If you want to grow wealth, the best way to do it is over a long period of time. And that is a thoughtful thing that goes all the way back to Ben Franklin. The idea, it's not against compounding. They're perfectly happy for people to hold assets of some kind, but there is a very real lock-in effect. You own a particular asset and you're very strongly incentivized from an arbitrary tax perspective, not to realize the gains on that asset and put your capital into what might be a more efficient use of it. The idea of markets as an efficient capital allocating function does depend on people being able to move capital out of one investment and into another. And the lock-in effects, I think, are quite real. So the idea is, is not that people would take their money out and put it under their mattress. I think the idea is to uh, unlock the uh, assets held by these very high income individuals um, and allow them to put it into what they see as the most efficient use of capital going forward. Hey, Preston, I have a question for you, which is I agree that the idea of taxing unrealized gains seems to me very problematic and challenging. But I have a view 
which you may or may disagree with, which is that uh, some on the progressive side of the Democratic Party have been pushed to this place. I don't know if they've been pushed to this place, but are, they're, are, they're at this place in part because what I would describe as basic loopholes and things like actually just capturing the taxes uh, that we currently have, which is to, meaning upgrading the IRS, dealing with carried interest, dealing with, uh, with, with things like the estate tax, dealing with things like the real estate tax, that those things, which I think a lot of people think are actually quite rational, um, are not supported by you either. And so at some point, there, there becomes an issue of how do you, how do you capture the, the tax revenue that clearly this country needs at some point anyway? Well, the fact is we're capturing the vast majority of the, the tax revenue from these, these wealthy individuals, and they're taxed at multiple levels. If you're, if you're taxed, uh, your first tax when you earn the income, then if you invest that into a, into a corporate stock, you're going to be, the corporation is going to be taxed, and then you're going to be taxed uh, with capital gains. And now we want to make that unrealized capital gains. They want to raise the capital gains rate to, uh, to the ordinary rate. So now instead of it just being um, tax at, a, a, the, at the second level of taxation at a lower level. Now we're talking about having the second level of taxation at the same high level that, 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 that they're already be, being taxed at on their ordinary income. So the, the idea that, the, that, the, that this investment income is somehow escaping uh, taxation, uh, the fact of the matter is it's all double taxation and triple taxation. So um, what we're looking for is actually a fair tax code that only taxes each dollar once and not one that and, that, and that's where all these problems in the tax code are coming from, is the fact that we're trying to get at dollars multiple times. Hey, but, but just, go, ahead. Go, ahead, go ahead, Andrew. Go ahead, Becky. No, go ahead. Well, just Tobin, just to this idea of whether this is a, you know, a genuine effort or whether this is something that is really just politics, again, back to this idea that taxing unrealized gains is a non-starter. It's not going to fly in the Democratic Party. You're not going to pick up anybody on the other side of the aisle. If you really want to do this, why don't you talk about doing something like the stepped-up basis of death, taxing money over those times? That's a conversation that you might actually get somewhere with if you're really serious about doing this. It's just, it seems to me that this is like an easy way to, to rile people up, rile voters up, because it sounds easy. Pay their fair share. You're not describing what's actually happened with some of these things. Is this a real effort or not? I mean, Biden is also still proposing to eliminate the step that faces to death, to be quite clear. And that's a proposal that he personally cares a lot about. He talks about that a lot on the stump. He talks about that a lot um, uh, at, at kind of private levels. So that's still out there. Uh, you know, I, I do think that there is some politics behind this. There obviously is. I think that the common sense intuition that ordinary voters have, that not only we need more tax fairness in a kind of abstract way, but that, uh, at, you know, the people should be paying taxes on these dollars at some point, and that you would pay taxes if you realize the gains, and that you shouldn't be able to indefinitely evade realization of gains um, through uh, various various kind of gaming mechanisms, including the step that basis. That's the, the voter intuition that this is aimed at. You know, I think in some ways, the well, way to think about it is the is least of the gaming of the systems. I mean, you have to die to make it happen. Sure. So it's not a great thing to have act out. I can see them going after some other things that might make more sense, saying that if you are borrowing against your shares, you're going to get taxed on that. You're not going to get to write it off on your taxes. That makes sense. If you wanted to just do the easy stuff, that would seem like a much easier solution to go after and do those real things. This either seems like it is politics or it is a, a case of negotiation. I'm going to say some outrageous things so I can get the things I really want on the side when we negotiate down. Yeah, I don't think that that kind of anchoring uh, in negotiations is really taking place here. I think this is pretty immediately written off by the people they need, namely Manchin and Cinema. I don't think there's a lot of interest here, although Cinema did express some some openness to a similar idea last year. So I think this mostly is about politics. It's about trying to put the idea out there, figure out whether it's viable, um, you know, sort of take the hits that it's going to take uh, with an eye toward maybe getting something like this enacted, you know, four, six, eight, ten years down the road, uh, and in the immediate term to have it available as a political thing to run on. So, yeah. you know, there certainly is some political calculation. The entire budget is a, a political messaging document. I think they believe in a lot of these ideas, but the immediate, you know, function of all of it is to, to put those ideas out there. So maybe we're the suckers for spending so much time talking about it. Anyway, Tobin, Preston, thank you very much. It's good to see you both. Thanks. Yeah. You get the calls about, uh, we'll cover all your funeral expenses. If for, do you <laughs> Not get yet. No, you Not don't get yet. That, that, I get those. And I, I, every time I ask the same thing, I go, no, do I have to die? <laughs> For, for this, okay. and not they the best go, bargain. yeah, that's, and go, man, that I, does not sound fun. you have a hard job uh, selling that. Coming up, uh, supply chain issues, uh, hitting auto sales, a preview of what to expect from the nation's biggest automakers when the numbers uh, come out. That's next, and we're counting down to the March jobs report. Fairlead Strategies founder Katie Stockton 
joins us with what investors can expect. Futures ahead of the number, uh, right now of about 200 or so points. We'll be right back. Welcome back to Squawk Box this morning. Automakers start to roll out quarterly sales reports today, but a lack of supply has the industry tapping the brakes. Phil LeBeau joining us with that story. Phil, good morning. Andrew, these will be ugly numbers when we hear from uh, some of the automakers today. For the most part, we're going to be hearing about first quarter numbers. There'll be a few March results in there, but any way you slice it, uh, it is tough for the auto dealers right now. It's tough for the automakers, mainly because of the supply chain that has been hit by the chip crisis. So here's the numbers that are expected. March, 12.7 million, might hit 13 million if we get lucky. Last year, it was 17.8 million, and in the first quarter, it'll be down 15.2% versus last year. The tight supply chain, specifically when we're talking about se semiconductor chips and the lack of supply, that's what's going to be hurting everything. Look, have you been to a dealership lately? This is what you see. There's nothing on the lot. There's nothing in the showroom. That's because the automakers, they're not able to replenish supply. They just do not have enough of the key components in order to build out the models that are in demand. So when you take a look at some of the specific automakers, keep in mind that Ford announced yesterday that it's going to be shutting down production at its Flat Rock, Michi Flat Rock, Michigan plant next week. That's where they build the Mustang. Why? A lack of semiconductor chips. And we're seeing this with other automakers, too. It's not just Ford. And as you take a look at General Motors, Toyota, and Tesla, the Q1 results we'll get from GM and Toyota today. They're not going to be that great, although GM might be a little bit better uh, than they have been in the past quarters. They've been able to manage the last quarter pretty well. And then Tesla will be getting the Q1 delivery numbers likely tomorrow or Sunday. Most believe we're probably going to get it tomorrow. And those are the numbers that are going to drive a lot of attention to Tesla on Monday. We also get the Ford numbers on Monday. But again, first quarter, ugh. It's not looking good, guys. Remember when everybody said, hey, wait until 2022. Yeah, we'll have all the production back for the automakers. I think we're going to be waiting a while.
So what do you think, Phil? Handicap it. 24, 25? What are we really talking about? In terms of when we get back to full production? Yeah. I think we get to full production likely by the middle of next year, at the latest, if not sooner. Most are pretty optimistic among the auto executives I've talked with that by the end of this year, they really should have ramped up production. Now, having said that, Andrew, if you asked me this back in September, I would have said, oh, yeah, first quarter, second quarter, things are going to be looking better. I mean, it keeps getting pushed out every time we talk. When do you think that prices will, will come back to some semblance of reality? Not for a while. Have you been out to look for a car lately? They're not moving. I know it. Maybe on the lower end. It. Maybe on the lower end, you might have some consumers uh, on the lower end of the market who might be saying, I can't afford this, especially with high gas prices. But generally speaking right now, we're not seeing the resistance. And then there might be, by the way, by the time that happens, there'll be a glut of used cars, fossil fuel cars. And I imagine there's going to be a whole bunch of people just trying to buy EVs. And therefore, then what are the value of those cars going to be? It's going to get it's going to get messy. Yeah, but that's for that's a long ways out. Andrew, we're a long ways from that happening. I would say not until 24, 25 at the earliest. I mean, we just have so low production on EVs right now. Right. Phil, thank you. Appreciate it. Bex. Thanks, Andrew. Up next, we're going to talk stocks and what investors can expect from today's jobs report with Katie Stockton of Fairlead Strategies. And later, Barry Diller and David Geffen, reportedly under the microscope of federal authorities over trades around Activision days before Microsoft's deal to buy the company. We'll speak to former SEC chair Harvey Pitt. We'll bring you uh, Barry Diller's comments on this, too. Squawk Box will be right back. We get ready to kick off trading in the second quarter. The futures right now indicated up uh, 200 points on the Dow. First quarter was a rough one uh, for the markets. All three major averages posted their worst uh, quarter is, since March of 2020, with the Dow and the S&P 500 losing uh, nearly 5% each. The NASDAQ, meanwhile, dropped more than 9%. Some insight on what the technicals are signaling for this quarter. Let's bring in Katie Stockton, founder and managing partner 
at Fair Lead Strategies. We know we could put technical analysts in a, in a closed room, a cone of silence, and they just look at the numbers and decide what to do, it, it, you know, Ukraine notwithstanding, all these other things notwithstanding. But we got to ask you about the inverted yield curve. If, there, if, if it is a reliable predictor of a recession, you would want to factor that in to what to do in the stock market, because recessions aren't good. Yeah, for sure. I mean, it is a reliable indicator of a recession. However, there's a major lead time, and that lead time can range anywhere from, say, six months to maybe 33 months. And that's something we're somewhat uncomfortable with in terms of using it as an indication for the stock market, at least in the near term. In fact, if you look back at the five inversions before this one, the market actually rallied for several months in, in most cases. So we have, not, I'm not saying that that's causal, uh, but we do have a market that's fairly strong um, at this time in terms of momentum, even as we come into this jobs report. I know the jobs reports have not been well received year to date here, but the market's a bit stronger this time around. It does have better momentum to the upside. We are looking for the S&P 500 to forge higher, and it's not to say we won't see that recession, but I think more importantly, what investors should focus on is momentum and make sure that they're on the right side of the market, but also managing risk. And they can do that by either being mindful of any overbought downturns or sell signals that arise and or breakdowns. Of course, right now we don't have a lot of breakdowns with the relief rally, so that's a welcome development. So what type of, of additional percentage gains and what type of time frame would you be looking at if you assume that there is something to this signal? In other words, do you really want to stay for the last X amount of gains in the market if it's 5, 10, 15, instead of 30 or 40 percent? And if it's two, three, four, five months instead of a year and a half? Are you confident that it'll be that long and that the gains will be worth it to stick around if, if it is right, the indicator? Well, uh, you know, as a technical analyst, it's really hard not to be more short to intermediate term and focused because we're so close to the markets. And I think that as it stands short term, that there is enough upside to dictate staying with the market. The last time we spoke, we talked about maybe sell in May. Uh, so we'd like to recommend managing risk through those downdrafts. And for us, the levels that are important for the S&P 500, about 4820 on the upside, that's minor resistance. We think that will actually be penetrated, albeit briefly, similar to what we saw in 2018. And, and then it becomes more of a determination from a portfolio management perspective as to whether folks build exposure, that short-term in nature ahead of that, or if they just stay with existing exposure. That just depends on their time horizon for that portfolio. Of course, where risk really becomes heightened for the market, in our opinion, is when support is taken out by the S&P 500. It's a super top-down oriented tape, meaning all the stocks are being highly influenced by the market's price action. So if the S&P were to break down, we'd say that it increases risk for even defensive stocks. So we wanna watch that 4,200 support level for the S&P 500. It's obviously not relevant in the very near term, but going forward, we are looking for more of a range-bound environment this year. And if that level's taken out, I think we're talking about more of a bear market move than a trading range. So you, you're not even comfortable to say that the lows are in for, for the markets in a, on an intermediate term? No, not yet. We think short term upside and then some kind of sort of nasty retest, our, our version of a double dip, right? Um, in terms of the long term momentum having deteriorated late last year behind the major indices. And we've really seen that manifest itself as of Q1. I think Q2 will look a lot better than Q1, but I don't think we're out of the woods yet in terms of some kind of retest of support. Let's go to, uh, to a couple of other things. What about gold? What about Bitcoin? Both in, in uptrends, would you say? Bitcoin's pulled back the last couple of days. Yeah, I mean, uh, the markets, the risk assets out there are digesting their gains. Short-term overbought readings are being worked off. I don't think we're looking for any kind of significant pullback in Bitcoin or the likes. It, they do have short-term breakouts on the cryptocurrency front. Gold prices, of course, look a bit different. We have seen a pullback develop there, but that pullback followed a major long-term triangle breakout. Triangles tend to be ultra high probability in my world. So we're looking for gold prices to trend higher over the long term. So we're kind of recommending to stay with those existing positions. 
And of course, that would naturally be associated with a tape that is somewhat like what we have already year to date, something that is a bit more risk off in, in nature. So it's all about reconciling those time frames. Do we have a, a bullish short term bias for Bitcoin and especially altcoins that tend to outperform when we have that kind of risk on tape? And the market sentiment isn't at the point yet where it's overly bullish. We had an overly bearish reading mid-March. If you look at things like the fear and greed index, that was down at 16% in mid-March. And right now it's sitting at 47%, where it starts to sort of give us a, a red flag would be above, I'd say, 65 or 70%. So we still have room for these risk assets to move higher before sentiment gets to the point where it's a worry for the market. Great. Katie, thank you. We'll take, it, uh, take it all into account. Thanks a lot. See you. Okay, it is uh, just now after 8 a.m. in New York. You're watching Squawk Box. I'm Andrew Ross Sorkin along with Becky Quick and Joe Kernan. Let's show you the futures an hour and a half before the market's set to open, but a half an hour before we get the big jobs number. S&P 500 up about 25 points. Dow about 200 points. NASDAQ looking to open about 100 points. How are we going to get a preview of those numbers in just a moment? We've got a panel of experts ready for instant analysis of that data when it hits the wires at 8.30 a.m. Eastern time. Everybody's going to be watching that number, uh, including the Fed. We'll be thinking about what happens to interest rates. Becky. Andrew, thanks. Let's get over to Dom, too. He's been taking a look at this morning's pre-market movers. Dom, what's up? All right, so consumer discretionary is a big focus, obviously, with a lot of folks looking at the jobs picture, maybe what that consumer spending picture is going to be like. Well, this one's a little bit of a cross-section between a couple different narratives. The casino stocks are among some of the biggest gainers in the S&P 500 so far this morning. Led by Wynn Resorts, you can see they're up about nearly 3%. Las Vegas Sands is up 1%. MGM Resorts up fractionally right now. Analysts over at Citigroup have upgraded Wynn Resorts to a buy rating from a prior neutral, although they lower their target price ever so slightly from $98 down to 96 half. And the reason why is they think that the casino stocks have pulled back enough where Wynn Resorts has become a more attractive valuation target. Also, the fact that there is more clarity around regulations and licensing restrictions going on in Macau and China. So that's the reason why casino stocks are up in the, in the pre-market trade. Wynn Resorts is driving a lot of that sentiment. Also watching what's happening right now, you mentioned Jobs Day. Bank stocks always a big focus, especially in light of yesterday's trading action. During the sell-off, the S&P 500 financial sector was the worst performing sector on the day. So outsized losses in names like J.P. Morgan Chase, Bank of America, Citigroup, Wells Fargo, and Morgan Stanley are now reversing a little bit today. You can see J.P. Morgan, Bank of America, Citigroup up just about half to 1%. Wells Fargo and Morgan Stanley, the same kind of thing. So bank stocks, Jobs Day, interest rates, the Fed, all kind of a big focus right now. And then a check on the top ticker searched on our website, CNBC.com, in yesterday's full session. Interest rates continue to dominate. The 10-year yield remains number one, but among some of the single stock tickers, Advanced Micro is up 1%, Tesla up a quarter of a percent, and then GameStop with the news of that possible stock split coming up. And remember, WTI crude is still in the top five, and within the top 10, that 10-year, two-year interest rate spread. Again, the rest of the top 10, Becky, on my Twitter feed at the Domino, highlights from the top 50. And I will point this out. Joe mentioned that crypto trade with Katie Stockton just in the last few moments. This is the first time in a while that not one single cryptocurrency made the top 50 list, not even Bitcoin. So an interesting dynamic hmm. to keep an eye on right now. Yeah, I like that the two-year, 10-year spread is there. We're getting nerdier and nerdier yes, by the are. day, Dom. <laughs> you got Thank it. you. See ya. All right, coming up, uh, we are under a half hour away from the March jobs report. We're bringing the numbers and the reaction as soon as they hit. Stay tuned. You're watching Squawk Box. This is CNBC.
Welcome back to Squawk. We had a news alert for you. Bloomberg reporting that China now preparing to allow U.S. regulators to see the audit reports of most Chinese companies listed in New York as soon as the middle of this year. Now, shares of U.S. Uh, listed China tech companies surging on this. This has been a sticking point, as you may remember, for the two countries for a very long time. Under former President Trump, Congress had passed a law that would have mandated kicking Chinese companies out that didn't allow for audit inspections right off of U.S. exchanges uh, in about two years. So lots of folks going to be focused on that this morning. Looking at Alibaba up about 6 percent, Didi up over 15 percent, giving people uh, a little bit of confidence that there might be some more credibility behind those numbers. Meantime, also some new details this morning on the story of a big options bet from earlier this year that's fallen under a lot of scrutiny. The Wall Street Journal reporting that authorities are investigating at least one meeting between Activision Blizzard CEO Bobby Kotick and investor Alex von, Alexander von Furstenberg ahead of a January announcement by Microsoft that it would acquire Activision for about $69 billion. The journal says that meeting took place just days before von Furstenberg and media moguls Barry Diller and David Geffen placed a big bet on Activision shares that has since netted them about $60 million in unrealized profit so far. Sources telling the journal both the Justice Department and SEC are looking into whether the transaction broke insider trading laws. CNBC has reached out to Diller, Geffen, and von Furstenberg for comment. In a statement to CNBC earlier, the Wall Street, to the Wall Street Journal, Diller denied any knowledge of a potential Microsoft deal for Activision. Um, also, a spokesman for Kodak saying the CEO didn't reveal any sensitive knowledge to von Furstenberg at their meeting. This story, of course, raising lots of questions about what's appropriate conduct for CEOs in terms of conversations. And we're going to talk about that right now. Joining us is former SEC Chairman Harvey Pitt. He's now CEO of uh, consulting and law firm Colorado Partners. Thank you for joining us. Uh, look, Barry Diller has been very outspoken, said it in a statement this morning. I just I just actually saw it again. Uh, says this was a coincidence, says that David Geffen had a thought that this was a, a buyout target or maybe something that would get taken private. Um, he believes that there's email traffic and other things that will uh, demonstrate that. But it does raise other questions. It, it, and assuming he's right, and I don't know if you assume he's right, but if he is right, what CEOs, what kind of meeting CEOs should or shouldn't have? This was apparently a social meeting. The difficulty you have here is that whether or not anything untoward took place, this meeting was, to put it bluntly, stupid. But the reason I say that is you've got a CEO under fire. And the negotiations with Microsoft didn't just happen overnight. There had to have been discussions going on. When you then sit down with potential investors, people who might be interested in trading, even if you think you're not disclosing confidential information, your body language may give things away. Your refusal to answer certain questions, your hesitation can create problems. This is not a smart meeting by any stretch of the imagination. Okay, but so Harvey, I'm going to take it in a slightly different direction. Let's assume this is a social meeting, which I believe is what at least uh, Bobby Kotick, and I, I think they went into that meeting thinking it was. You have a social meeting. Maybe you, 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 you give it away through body language or not. Let's just assume, let's just say that's the case, actually. And then your friend, because we're calling this a social meeting, not an investor meeting, goes off and makes a trade, doesn't tell you, obviously, that it just goes off and does this, which, by the way, may be closer to the sort of facts of this case than anything else, which is they do have this, me they, they do have this meeting, uh, but then several days later, David Geffen or others suggest this. Maybe Alex von Furstenberg thinks, great, it sounds like a, a, a good, uh, good investment idea. And, you know, I kind of felt maybe after this, 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 this breakfast I had or brunch I had that, you know, something could eventually happen. Then what? Well, at this juncture, uh, if that um, happened, uh, it seems to me that the people who traded should have realized that having even an innocent social meeting just before making a major trade was going to raise enormous questions and put the CEO in a very difficult position. 
This is not the kind of conduct that should be taking place. It's the kind of conduct that raises questions. And even if everything is innocent, it's just foolish. And the way to avoid it is for CEOs, when they're in the, engaged in very serious discussions, to stop these social meetings with people who might trade uh, or at least be certain that if anything got said at the meeting that might have tipped off a potential trade, that they then make disclosure to the public at large. Hey, Harvey, um, I, I hear what you're saying on that, but wouldn't it be more of a tip off to everybody if a CEO suddenly cleared his calendars because he was worried about any social event that he was supposed to be attended being seen in just this matter? I mean, if, if somebody suddenly says, oh, I can't come to your party on Friday night, sorry, and I can't meet you for lunch on Saturday, and I'm not going to be available for that breakfast we had planned on Tuesday, I think one of two things. Either you have COVID or you are in a position where there's something big happening at your company, and I need to pay a little more attention. We have to go back a step and recognize that this was a CEO already under fire for his apparent mishandling of abusive conduct within the workplace. When you're in that kind of a stressful situation, you take steps to lower your profile. And social meetings don't have to take place. You're, there are lots of reasons why they may not make sense, including having to get root canal or going to a family gathering. There are many explanations that can take um, uh, the burden off the CEO, but having these meetings while under fire and knowing that he was in the process of negotiating something, because Microsoft didn't just come out with an offer uh, full-blown uh, when it was announced, it took a while to get to that point. He should have avoided his social contacts until he was in a position to make a public announcement. Yes. And this just goes to liability slash responsibility and how you think the SEC could look at this. Let's say, just for, 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 for the purposes of our discussion, uh, that there really was uh, above, above board in the context that nothing was said during said meeting. Maybe body language or somebody thinking they're reading something that they aren't, who knows? Uh, but clearly, uh, Barry Diller has been quite public about at least his perspective on this, which is that he says that, that, that that's not the case. It would be complicated, I would imagine, to charge uh, Mr. Kodak with anything because it's unclear whether he would have received anything uh, a benefit back, right? I mean, that's one of the, the, the issues around uh, being a tippy, if that's what we're describing here. And then the second question is how you would hold or not David Geffen, Diller, and, uh, and, and von Furstenberg responsible or not based on that information. I think you um, are correctly um, dissecting the question into the legal issues, and I'm trying to look at this pragmatically. Um, to me, it's not so much a question of whether Kotech violated the law. To me, it's really a question of whether he had any business meeting with anyone at a point in time when it was likely he was already in discussions about a possible acquisition by Microsoft, whether or not that acquisition might ever take place. He owed a fiduciary duty to his shareholders not to jeopardize but Harvey, their position. how would you know that your friend is assuming assuming that assuming what you're saying is right and and uh, this also assumes that somehow he either had body language or worse how would you know that your friend i mean this is not i, I have to say alex von furstenberg is a professional investor but i don't think that contextually the way that their relationship worked to the extent i understand it was that meaning you know harvey if you came over to my house and i happen to be a ceo uh, it's not clear to me that I would consider that you might trade in my stock if, if, if I was in charge of a company tomorrow. You're absolutely right 
but the case books are filled with instances in which people went to social events at a time when they were involved in very sensitive discussions and other people picked up on body language and traded. And there was liability in some of those cases. Here, I'm not suggesting that there is liability. As I said earlier, we don't know what actually happened. What I'm saying is he didn't have to have these meetings and he could have made an assumption that one slip or one wrong movement or one hesitation could lead somebody to trade and you avoid circumstances like that to protect your shareholders. That's wholly different from whether there's liability. It's just not smart conduct in my view. Harvey Pitt, always good to see you and uh, to get your perspective and analysis of these situations. Thank you. Thank you. Becky? Thanks, Andrew. Still to come this morning, the number of the day. We've got the March jobs report on the way at the bottom of the hour. Stay tuned. Squawk Box will be right back. Coming up, the government's March jobs report, plus uh, top tech stocks in the second quarter and beyond. Investor Dan Niles is going to join us. Stay tuned. You're watching Squawk Box on CNBC.
Okay, here we go. When we come back, we've got that breaking economic data. It's the March jobs report. It is just a few minutes away. And our all-star panel is ready and waiting with predictions. We've got the insights once the numbers hit, too. Stay tuned. You're watching Squawk Box, and this is CNBC. Welcome back to Squawk Box on CNBC, the March Employment Report, just minutes away. Let's bring in our jobs panel. Jason Furman is former chairman of the Council of Economic Advisors, currently a Harvard Kennedy School professor. He's, we have a lot of titles here and not a lot of time. Tyler Goodspeed, former acting CEO chairman. He's now with the Cato Kalin Institute and Stanford's Hoover Institution. It's actually just the Cato Institute. Neela Richardson, chief economist at ADP, Stephanie Link, Chief Investment Strategist at Hightower Advisors and a CNBC contributor, and uh, two people who need no introduction or titles, our own uh, Rick Santelli uh, and Steve Leisman. Wow, I did it so that I've actually got three or four uh, seconds, but uh, it is time now for the March jobs report, and Rick Santelli has the numbers. Rick. Yes, uh, the numbers should be hitting the screen momentarily. 431,000, 400, 31,000 on non-farm payrolls. It's a bit of a miss. We're looking for a number closer to 500,000. Private payrolls, 426,000. Also a miss looking for a number close to 500,000. Change in manufacturing payrolls, a little better at 38,000. That follows 36,000, but I, I shudder to go in the rearview mirror. They'll probably see some revisions there. The unemployment rate, a new low, 3.6%, 3.6%. We all know pre-COVID, that was 3.1% in February of 2020, getting ever closer. Up four-tenths on average hourly earnings month over month on the year-over-year -year basis. That was 5.6%, 5.6, so 0.4 on month over month, 5.6 on year over year. That is stellar. Geez, 5.6, that is a new high watermark. And if we look at average hours worked, 34.6, ticked down one-tenth versus expectations and rearview mirror. 
The underemployment rate, or U6, is 6.9. That is also a kind of post-COVID low, and that's a great thing to see. And labor force participation, 62.4. It's exactly one point under February of 2020, which was 63.4, a high watermark there. We do see that on the interest rate side, well, we're at 240 and tens. We're close to 242. Uh, but the real issue continues to be that this is now the 12th month, a dozen months above 400,000, even though it was a bit of a disappointment. And in the rearview mirror, here's some revisions, and they're rather healthy. Uh, last month, 678,000 turns into 750,000. And manufacturing payrolls last month ticked up 2,000 to 38, which makes this month unchanged of course we're all going to pay very close attention to the first day of the new quarter it certainly seems to have popped interest rates a bit and it certainly seems to, of course put some volatility in the equity markets especially after lots of talk of the rebalancing last month and some option trades playing havoc mm -hmm. with yesterday's s p joe all yours all right thanks rick so, so 12 months kept that, it's almost like it's a year Kind of, almost. Let's get right to our uh, jobs <laughs> panel for some, right? For some instant uh, reaction. All right, Jason, there's things that you're anticipating on one of these reports that, that you're hoping things are better, and then you're worried about something that might not be up to speed. Um, can you list the two? Was there anything that, what, that, that disappointed you, or all pretty good? I think the biggest news here was that average hourly earnings were up 0 0.4. Um, that's a 5% annual pace. That's roughly the pace they've been on for the last year. Um, and that's consistent with a decent amount of inflation this year. Um, last month, we got a bit of a reprieve in terms of average hourly earnings growth, um, but that reprieve didn't repeat itself um, in the month of March. I think that's the biggest news here. Um, the second biggest news here is you know, the jobs number. I think that's a pretty small miss. You have the positive revisions to last month. You have the larger than expected decline in the unemployment rate. You have the increase in the participation rate. Overall, this is a very, very strong report um, and no reason at all for the Fed to do anything other than 50 basis points at its next meeting. Really? 50. Okay. Tyler, uh, good speed. The, uh, well, number one, that, that kind of threw me. I, I wasn't expecting. So we're definitely going to do 50. Oh, I know what I was going to ask you. The, the participation rate. It's almost back to where it was. So what about the great resignation? What about all the new normal, the post-pandemic world is totally different? Maybe not so different. Well, that's certainly the hope, and it is encouraging to see at least a, a tenth of a percentage point tick up in the participation rate. One thing that I'm going to be really looking for, digging into the, into the details, is what happened to participation among those 55 and older. Because as you said, there was the great resignation. By my estimations, about 1.5 million early retirements in 2020 and 2021. We are really going to need to see those folks come back. Because one thing we've seen in the past year is that 30 to 35-year-olds coming into the labor force just are not perfect substitutes for experienced 55 and older uh, exiting the labor force. Neil, one of the things that struck me about uh, your comments was that, were that we can't expect uh, this type of really strong activity necessarily to, to continue, that there will be a post-pandemic, uh, not really a slowdown, but maybe a reversion to the mean in terms of GDP and, and everything else. Are we seeing any of that yet, or, or this is still we, something we can't keep up forever? Well, you know, over the last six months, the pace has been around a half a million. So you are seeing a bit of a moderation. And the closer we get to full or maximum employment, I think the more these monthly gains will moderate. But I'd like to pick up on what Chair Powell said uh, earlier, because there's something missing in this report. It's great. I'll take it. But it doesn't really point to the concern uh, that Chair Powell expressed that the labor market was tight to the point of being unhealthy. And you saw that in the JOLTS data, the quits rate, but also the jobs opening rate. And we we're still in this place of imbalance between uh, labor demand and labor supply. Companies are having a difficult time hiring and retaining in this environment. And in the meantime, the skill set that companies want is changing. And so it's time, even though this machine has gone on for a while, peeking under the hood, to see where the wage gains are or is really critical in this moment. Okay, um, Steph, 
I, I, I'm just going along what's, what's in, you know, this is the, the order they put it in. This has nothing to do with me. And, and this could be the most important comments we're seeing right now. Could be, Steph. Could be. <laughs> uh, look, I think that the, the number is, um, is very good, especially with the revisions. Um, if you look at a lot of different job metrics in the last couple of weeks, we've seen rock bottom <coughs> initial claims. And initial claims are a leading indicator for jobs. The non-farm payroll numbers is backward looking, as we know. ADP very, was very good. And the interesting thing about ADP, they had 377,000 services jobs, payrolls, right? And so for me, when I looked at the wage numbers for today, I was actually wondering if that 5.5% wage number year over year expectation might come in a little bit softer. And in fact, it came in a little bit better. Last month, we know what happened. It was a mix shift, more towards travel and leisure uh, jobs, which are lower paying jobs versus uh, technology and utilities. And that just didn't happen this month. So look, that is the number one important number to look at. It's the wage number. And it does not change anything of what the Fed now has to do. Fed is behind the curve. There's inflation everywhere. And, and that also includes yesterday's core uh, uh, PCE deflator number, which was really hot. Steve, you know, in movie credits, you know, it's not always, sometimes the biggest actor is like, and, you know, Tom Hanks. It, it, and that's what, I, that's what I'm feeling right now, since you're, 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 you're last here. But maybe most important, and you've had time now, I've given you to, to, to really have some, some smart things to say. Finally, something smart to say. You're, you're right, Joe. Uh, you know, it used to be in the old days that the, uh, the second byline on the story was the most important one. That changed over time. But I'll take it, Joe. And, and thanks for the Tom Hanks reference. I could do a lot worse. Um, let me, I, I'm very encouraged by this report. I hardly see it as a miss because economists have been so far off in terms of trying to get anywhere close to this number that the fact that they're within 60,000 is a huge victory as far as I'm concerned. And inside the number, there is some, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm taken by what you asked. Uh, I forget who it was, Neela before or, or, or whomever it was. Can we continue this? Because what we really see here is a continuation of the rebound from the slowdown that we had earlier this year. You did uh, 366,000 uh, uh, on, the, on the private side, and then you had 112,000 on leisure and hospitality. Retail trade, 49,000. It suggests people are going back to the stores. And by the way, I'm a little more encouraged than Neela is on this issue of whether or not the, you know, the market is, 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 not, is, is unhealthy in terms of how tight it is. Because a couple of things, you had about 500,000 people, it looks like to me, come back to the workforce. And that's been, you know, three real good months in a row in terms of people come back, coming back. And I'm sure that Powell wants to see that. And just one other quick number, uh, Rick is 100% right. We are back to where we were in terms of the number of people in the workforce at 164.4 million. Our participation rate, however, is one percentage point below. Why is that? Because we had more people uh, uh, come into this world over that period of time. So there's still some room to bring people in to a tight labor market. One very interesting point here, oil and gas workers went down 0.4%. So I'll be watching that number to see if we get more workers in the oil fields and maybe, Joe, more oil. Uh, Okay, now I'm going to start at, at the top again. So, Jason, did uh, did did anything that that you just heard from these this illustrious panel did did it pique your interest, or do you need to uh, refine the thinking of anything or uh, any addenda? No, I mean I think you know when you have Chair Powell saying it's an unhealthy labor unhealthily tight labor market, um, what he's saying is we're still short of where we want to be on jobs, but the issue remains labor force participation. It's still lower, that labor force participation rate. There's very little the Fed can do um, to change that. Time is healing it. Every month um, it gets better, but it's not something that you know, needs to be a goal of policy. What needs to be a goal of policy is price stability, and this report is not consistent with where the Fed wants to be, where we should be in terms of price stability. Neil, on one of your previous uh, appearances, you, you said something that got a lot of pickup, and that was that not a single new job has actually been added. We're just getting back jobs. Are we, are we now, are we up, net up, or are we still just barely below pre-pandemic? Well, I haven't run the numbers yet in the last you know two minutes or so, but I think we, we can say we're within either, we're there or we're within striking distance. But 
the, the critical thing is that structurally the economy has changed as well. It's become more slanted towards e-commerce, warehousing, transportation, retail. Some, some places in the economy have already topped their 2019 levels. Where we're still seeing uh, some gaps is in leisure and hospitality and more pointedly customer facing industries that are typically low income. So there, there's some work to be done. Um, there's the, and that's also where you're seeing disproportionate impact for women and people of color. So the labor market's never perfect and I'm always going to try to make it uh, in, point to where it can be improved. Uh, those places still exist and I, I like Jason's point that over time we might see uh, some help there as well. Tyler, where, how do you read where we are in, in, in the Biden administration? You were obviously in a, a previous administration. Are, are there things mm -hmm. uh, that they should be doing, things that, uh, that they've done that hasn't helped, things that, that, the, that it has done that has helped? How do you see it? Well, I do think it's interesting that we've had a string of, of relatively uh, very strong jobs numbers in the first few months of this year and this this happened to be the first few the first few months in the past year when we didn't have the federal government actively raising implicit marginal tax rates on the return to work look i'm actually I'm, i keep glancing down at my phone to try and get more of the details from the report i think the household survey is is telling some interesting things there it looks like gains of over 700,000 in the in the household survey compared to an increase in the civilian labor force of about 400,000. That to me says that we are still pulling people from more from unemployment or as much from unemployment as from out of the labor force, which says to me that this, this is still a very tight labor market. And when we look back on, on, on the experience of the 1960s and 1970s, I think it's interesting that in the latter half of the 1960s was when inflation expectations really became unanchored, such that when the major supply shock of 73, 74 hit, consumers, businesses, households weren't able to look through that. And I think in the past year, we've run sort of a, a compressed replay of, of, of that scenario. We're inverted again, I see. Uh, Rick Santelli. Is that a sneeze or, or a cold? Well, you know what? I think it might just be the sniffles. Uh, we have to wait for the clothes to really make a judgment. I'll tell you what. Here's a wallet. This is going to change things, okay? Because we're all talking about are we going to get back? Are we going to normalize? Are, are the retirees going to unretire? This is going to answer it. And the answer is yes to all of those. And I'll tell you why. Because the CPI rate was close to 8%. Wages, as strong as they are post-COVID high uh, on the uh, year over year, was 5.6. There's a bit of a spread there and more. You have to use more dollars in your wallet because of inflation and savings rates starting to go down. Those two issues, I think, are going to bring people back in the workforce. And I do think that participation rate is going to narrow that 1% spread. And remember one thing, Joe, as you're looking at twos to tens, Look at where the spread was last week. Twos last week were under 230. This is an amazing move. It was a crazy quarter, and I would continue to look for short maturities to outpace the long end. Don't see that diminishing anytime soon. So, Stephanie, Jason said we'll get 50. Do you think we'll get a 50? And will the 50 help usher in this inverted yield recession, or um, uh, will, will that be part of the cause or will it not happen? Or will they be loathe to do 50 if we're slowing down? Well, look, I mean, they can do three more times, four times all in and just get back to normal policy, right? So they have to go above and beyond. And we do have inflation. We have it everywhere. As I mentioned, yesterday's number, core PCE deflator, was really very high. CPI is up at 8%, as Rick mentioned. PPI, close to 10%. Those numbers, next week, we get the CPI number. That's going to be ugly. So I just think they have to get... They have to get their arms around this. If they if they want to do 50, I think that, that the market can handle it. I think they have to do much more. But by the way, I actually don't think, even if they did seven or eight this year, it's not going to change inflation. Supply chains are going to help inflation. But at the, at the on the other spectrum, wages and rents are actually more sticky, and they're going up. So I feel like we're here and we're stuck with this inflation story for a while, and that's why the market is in this choppy trading range, and I don't expect that to, conti uh, to, to, uh, to change anytime soon. Steve, will we get a 50? Yeah, I think a 50 is coming, uh, Joe, and I think more than a 50. I, I think you're going to get uh, two 50s in a row at least. Um, I, I think the Fed wants to get back to where, uh, to a 2% 
number by the end of the year. Uh, and, and by the way, that would be one of the faster uh, rate hikes. And the question is, can we take it? I think you ask a good question of Neil, and Neil had an interesting response. You know, what do you do when we get people back to work, when we have to start creating jobs, you know, uh, uh, from, from the economy and from regular growth rather than a rebound? And just quickly to Tyler, Tyler, we had a 300,000 decline on the number of unemployed, and that was the same number of those not in the labor force went down by 300,000 as well. Um, and so we are finding a way to bring people into the workforce. Uh, it may be that we're stressed, and you're right to make that differential between the 400,000 uh, um, growth in the labor force versus the other 700,000 that you mentioned earlier. Okay. Um, I, we haven't done this before. We've got the six box. Do all of you have something to say, say right now uh, that, that's important? Because I want to try and do it all at once and see how hard that would be <laughs> to actually. Do, do you all have something? I'm going to count. I'm going to go three, two, one, and then everyone start talking. I'm, I'm serious. Let, let, let's do it. You ready? Three, two, one. No one's doing New that. highs in equities. <laughs> <laughs> Okay. The Fed at this me. point don't is mostly it. dealing Wait, with inflation in 2023. Yeah. <laughs> Sometimes it happens and we don't plan it. Uh, I thought we'd give everyone a Anyone have anything really cogent uh, to say before you know, we Joe, end the panel? I, 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 just one quick follow-up to Stephanie's point on wages, which I think is central to the inflation story when it comes to the labor market. The Fed's been able to rely on the fact that a lot of the wage growth has been in low-income jobs. But as you look at some of the anecdotal evidence from companies, especially in tech and the practices they're doing and the data that we see, um, that is starting to really shift towards higher income jobs. And it'll be interesting whether there'll be as much tolerance for wage growth when it comes at the upper end of the income spectrum as it has been when it was at, for lower pay jobs. Okay, very good, Neil, thanks. And uh, that's it, that'll do it. Thanks for our jobs panel, Jason, Tyler. Neela, Stephanie, uh, Rick, and Steve. We were able to do that, the three we of us. We talk all the time yeah, together. Rick. Watch, we'll, we'll show you guys how it's done. Put up Andrew real quickly in three boxes right. with us. The ES, the NASDAQ, the Dow, and the Russell are positive is what we're seeing here uh, in terms of Bitcoin and the risk off sentiment coming into play a bit of a precursor in terms of what could happen uh, throughout the day here. So keep a close eye on Bitcoin, keep a close eye on the indices. And then in terms of the bid that we saw recently off of, well, I mentioned here the run up off the March lows, but take note of how well Bitcoin was unable to take out the January lows in the month of February. And Notice here again, well, uh, much like the S&Ps down the Russell, the March lows were unable to take out the Feb lows. Now, a reminder, the NASDAQ actually did take out the Feb lows in the month of March, but it was the only one of the four majors to do so. And then again, Bitcoin really led this huge run up that we saw. We talked about the breakout earlier in this week up into the 48,000 level and how what we were looking for at that point was a real high energy vertical counter trend type move in. Well, it certainly doesn't seem like we're getting that again as we've rolled over a bit here off a key area of resistance and kind of potentially working our way right back into that range. Now, the reason I bring this to your attention, I think it's important if we do continue to see follow through and uh, directional conviction to the downside off this most recent test of resistance, uh, energy through 42,040 opens up a door for a retest of those lower extremes that we saw back in January, February, down around 34,000. A quick look at where things stand and well, Take a look, much like the ES, the NASDAQ, the Dow, the Russell, holding above the 50-day moving average, but again, starting to roll over here. You can see that we've come off the last couple of days. It'd be interesting to see if, well, that is a, a bit more widespread in terms of the ES, the NASDAQ, the Dow, the Russell, in terms of what we see over the next couple of days. Does Bitcoin lead on the way up and on the way down? Let's bring in Alex Coffey. He's the co-host of Next Gen Investing here on the TD Ameritrade Network. He's got his eye on the micro NASDAQ this morning. Alex, welcome. I was just talking about how the Bitcoin futures led on the way up throughout the month of March. are starting to roll over. I guess the concern being here is we just tested key resistance in not only crypto, but also the four major indices, the ES up around 4,600, the uh, NASDAQ around 15,000. If we start to roll over here right now, this could be uh, a key indication that the bears are still in charge at this point. Uh, absolutely, Ben. I think that there's an argument to be made that part of the Bitcoin story could be tied to potential de-dollarization mm -hmm. down the line. But I think uh, the greater argument is that that's more of a short volatility 
uh, exposure. You look at uh, kind of risk appetite and how things have upticked over the past few weeks throughout this rally. You have a resurgence of the meme stocks. You have names like Tesla and Amazon surging. Names like Apple surging in the big tech space. And then, of course, cryptocurrencies led by uh, the, the primary in, in, in Bitcoin making just tremendous comebacks. To me, when you see all of those things line up together, Ben, that's less of a Bitcoin and crypto specific story, more of a short volatility mm. risk appetite, risk taking story of which the, the, the NASDAQ gets caught up into it. And so if you do see uh, cracks in that dam to be, uh, to be said in things like Bitcoin and things maybe like a Tesla or even some of the meme stocks uh, in the coming days, that could lead uh, to greater weakness in, in, the, in the, the NASDAQ and the micro NASDAQ. For uh, in a trade illustration, Ben, I did go to the micro NASDAQ options just to make things a little bit smaller. You know, I wanted to uh, also add to that thought. I mean, one of the things we've been uh, keeping close eye on is rates as well, Alex. I mean, that's been uh, basically the underlying uh, headwind for the most part for the indices since the beginning of the year. A uh, bit of a move back. Again, a nice rally off the March lows, but the NASDAQ kind of topping out around this 15,000 level. And for the most part, rates have come off ever so slightly, but you still have the 30 year up around 2.5%. You got the TNX around 24 and the drumbeat for a half a point rate hike starting to get a little bit louder for that May meeting. I mean, in theory, I guess I'm wondering, it seems to be tough for the indices to kind of rally amidst some of those headwinds that it's faced throughout the year. It's a really strong point, Ben. And uh, as we've seen such extreme movements in the Treasury market, I actually wouldn't see or wouldn't be surprised to see sort of a decoupling of what we think of in terms of that traditional inverse relationship between okay. yields and tech stocks. It actually could be the moment you see a bid into, into treasuries, if we get one, uh, could lead to actually a, a bit of a, of a sell-off in, in, the, in the equity market. But I want to talk about the example trade that I was talking about. Uh, in, in terms of this particular trade, what I was looking to do is just go on a couple weeks, and I wanted to, to really center this around the recent levels that we just reached uh, in, in the, uh, the NASDAQ uh, for our break even and so what we're doing is we're going out to 13 days to expiration this would be your traditional april monthly options cycle uh, a little bit more liquidity there in the micro uh, nasdaq options we're looking to sell one of the 15,200 call that's the crux of this trade but in order to define the risk uh, and, and reduce the capital required we're going to go ahead and we're going to buy the 15,350 uh, call it's 150 points wide. And remember, for the micro NASDAQ, every point represents two US dollars. So this is a $300 wide spread in which we're collecting uh, 50 points, which is equal to $100. So we're collecting one third the width of the strike. That's $100. And we have $200 in risk. You can see that here uh, on our risk profile. So anything that stays below 15,200 uh, at expiration, we'd expect this to expire worthless. Therefore, we'd keep our credit of 50 points or, or $100. If it does rally and go through uh, 15,350, we would be exposed to the upside for $200, but it would need uh, to basically get to new levels in terms of recent highs. I went ahead and I drew a ch uh, on our chart a line that represents the break even. The break even, you add that 50 points to our 15,200 uh, call, and you're going to get 15,250. As I zoom in here, Ben, what you're going to see. This perfectly basically paints the line of our mm. uh, February 2nd high as well as our most recent high. And of course, this is the break even. So this is where you know the trade doesn't necessarily make money or lose money. Um, but it is uh, notable, I think, that it kind of perfectly paints that price level. So what are you looking for here at this point, Alex, in terms of a uh, potential catalyst one way or the other? I mean, we just had the non-farm payrolls. You mentioned, uh, actually, interestingly enough, you feel like if we were to see rates start to come off a little bit, that we could see uh, the NASDAQ and the indices start to come off a little bit. What are we watching as far as uh, the next focal point here after the non-farm payrolls as we head into next week? Well, we're kind of into a lull here, uh, Ben, in terms mm -hmm. of, uh, of data, Fed speakers, as well as earnings. And so all of anything, uh, surprises the geopolitical front, all can impact uh, market prices. And that's why this particular strategy, uh, emphasis on neutral, is neutral to bearish. We need the market to actually come and beat us for this particular strategy not to be profitable. And so whenever I think that there's uh, room for either a, a, a rally or, or, or a, a sell-off, I'd rather give myself a higher probability of success and give myself some room. Alex, uh, coming off that key area of resistance with a market that's been so headline-driven, maybe that opens up the door for a little bit of price decay at this point as we just kind of grind lower. 
Exactly right. You don't even need it, though, with this trade. That's the beauty of it. All right. We'll keep an eye on this trade. Alex Coffey joining us. Check him out here throughout the day here on the TD Ameritrade Network. And, well, that's it for us here for Futures. Thanks for joining us this Friday morning. Happy April 1st, April Fool's Day. Uh, up next here on the TD Ameritrade Network. Lots to come throughout the day. Morning Trade Live. Oliver Rennix headed your way next. Again, thanks for joining us. Opportunities can be hard to find, like catching lightning in a bottle. In uncertain times, it's tempting to retreat or simply wait and see. At CME Group, we empower those who act. We deliver tools to help manage risk and capture opportunities in every market climate, across every major asset class, to seize each possibility at precisely the right moment. CME Group, opportunity is everywhere. Many option traders tend to focus on price and direction, but implied volatility can also be a big factor in options trades. In the Options for Volatility course, we explore what implied volatility is and how it can potentially affect the price of an option. For example, let's say an option trader wants to take a bearish position on a stock, but isn't sure whether to buy a put or sell a call. Both strategies are bearish, but looking beyond direction to consider the impact of implied volatility could help the trader choose between them. We also introduce strategies designed to harness changes in implied volatility. For instance, time spreads like counters and diagonals are designed to benefit from increases in implied volatility. Iron condors, on the other hand, are designed to benefit from falling implied volatility. After learning about the strategies, you can take the final assessment to test your knowledge. Head to the education tab on Thinkorswim for the full options for volatility course and a whole lot more. TD Ameritrade Network has arrived on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange new location with access to the biggest newsmakers in Wall Street, bringing you in-depth market coverage and real-time trade ideas. Do not miss our exclusive interviews with CEOs, bell ringers, traders, and stock pickers, keeping you informed as you navigate your investments. Don't miss Trading 360 at 11 a.m. Eastern and the watch list at 2 p.m. Eastern, live from the New York Stock Exchange, only on the TD Ameritrade Network. When traders tell us how to make Thinkorswim even better, we listen. Like Jack. He wanted a streamlined version he could access anywhere, no download necessary. And Kim. She wanted to execute a preset trade strategy in seconds. So we gave him Thinkorswim Web. Because platforms this innovative aren't just made for traders, they're made by them. Thinkorswim by TD Ameritrade. Welcome to Morning Trade Live. I'm Oliver. Fool's Day, April 1st. Watch your back. People doing shady stuff on days like today. All right. My uh, question is, are the Bulls going to be able to close it out on a good note? Or is it going to be an April Fool's fake out? Right now, we got some green futures. Looking pretty good. Uh, the stocks have had a little weakness the last couple days. This morning's employment report, nothing to complain about. Pretty good. Economy looks pretty good. Generally, the employment situation that Jay Powell has hung his hat on is living up to the expectations. The question is, is it going to be too good? Is the market going to refocus its attention on the stability of the economy and what that means for rate hikes? Since Powell started talking about the hikes and got one under the belt, market's been rallying. So right now it's kind of hard to say that uh, the market is terribly fearful of the path that the central bank has laid out. But there's good reason to think that uh, maybe what we've seen is a relief trade and a bounce within a bear trend but at this point it's just such a toss-up that it's hard to really know how to describe the status of the market right now for the nasdaq it ticked down 20 percent from the highs earlier in march but now that we've rallied about 17 and a half percent given back a couple percent the last days we called about 15 percent up off the lows that's a pretty tough way to figure out how to describe this because uh, you're pretty much stuck in the middle obviously bulls have made a really good run 
Uh, but uh, finding some resistance here at some important levels the last couple days and then seeing that some of the big uh, tech trades that powered up over the second half of March did slow down a little bit yesterday. We had a pretty big sell off in some of the chips. That wasn't very good. Uh, so again, we're just really uh, watching for any news flow uh, that uh, potentially could push the next leg higher out of Ukraine. There's not a ton right now, but uh, this week generally moving in the realm of positive direction without any real confirmation though of some of the reports over the last seven days that Russia would draw down military activity. We heard President Biden say that we should be pretty cautious about uh, believing everything we read and we hear until we see it. So as far as that situation goes, it hasn't really added a whole lot into the market action this week. Crude oil has been more dominated by supply discussion here and uh, through OPEC too. And so uh, we've seen that particular Russia linked asset kind of shift its uh, attention elsewhere even. So as we uh, look at stocks today, we'll figure out if we end on a positive note or not. NASDAQ uh, could potentially just kind of uh, fizzle and marinate maybe here around 15,000. But the Russell in particular doesn't look like it's gonna be very calm. We've had a quite a bit of volatility in small caps over the last few days. And uh, that's what I'm gonna be watching given the small caps had a real hard rejection at 2100. Great show coming up, a lot of stocks we're gonna talk about, some smart guests joining us. Let's take a look at the 10 year yield and let's look at the dollar. This morning we've got yields back jumping higher after the good print, but we also had yields just drifting basically as soon as the market closed yesterday. We saw bond prices started to drop off and yields inch higher. Generally we're just uh, very clearly in the uptrend for yields. So it seems it's gonna take some type of big risk off move to really keep bond yields down. Right now, it does seem that it requires some force for bond yields to go down. There's not really a natural two.
impacted uh, throughout the pandemic. So we're starting to see that normalization take place here uh, for that. Uh, Long-term employment uh, as those uh, without a job for over 27 weeks has fallen to 23.9% of the overall unemployed. So we're starting to see uh, those who have been kind of out of the workforce be pulled back in. I think that's an indicator of just how tight uh, the workforce really is or the labor market really is right now, Oliver. As for impact and what this means, you did see the twos, tens invert once again in response to this. Equity markets sold off slightly with about an eight point move lower in the S&P 500 futures. You now have a 74.4% probability of two uh, rate hikes or 50 basis points in this upcoming meeting in there May. There it is. This is an uptick from 69.4, so about a 5% uh, increase in that chance. But what I thought was notable, Oliver, going out to June now, you now have just under a 25%, a 23.4% of not 50 basis points, but an additional 75 basis points. There so we 125 go. basis points. Uh, by June is now about a one in four chance. Now with, we're talking. With almost uh, a certainty here in terms of an 83, 84% chance of getting uh, the two back to back 50 basis points hike. Oliver. So you're definitely uh, seeing uh, enough in this report that doesn't give the market any uh, pause to think that the Fed uh, means real business here in terms of uh, their hawkish rhetoric. And you're saying actually uh, a little bit of a tick up in what it's pricing in now for the Fed's path. That potential 75 three meetings from now that's new yeah no definitely i would say that yeah this is just two meetings from now uh and it's still hey yeah. this is not the most likely scenario but it went from under 10 percent to now almost 25 percent mm. so that's a two and a half uh, you know times increase in just sure. one day uh, well, the whole path basically is is what it means it just means the whole path of the total hikes we're getting now is has gone up I seem to recall somebody this week in a newsletter arguing that we should uh, speed up to 100 basis points pretty quick. Oh, it was me. All right, uh, Caroline, we've got some, uh, now that we got the serious news out of the way, let's talk about the dumb stuff. GameStop, <laughs> what's going on? I read your newsletter this morning, Oliver, so I, I was waiting for that plug. <laughs> yes, GameStop up about 13%. You're new, but you've, uh, you're learning me quick. <laughs> I'm, I'm catching on. Uh, but yeah, GameStop is seeking shareholder approval to increase the number of shares outstanding so it can split its stock. It wants to join the ranks of Alphabet and Amazon and Tesla and having a stock split. It's proposing an well, that, That's a group that makes sense. Shares. Apple, Amazon, so Alphabet, million. GameStop. Hey, <laughs> Reddit, Reddit uh, GameStop lovers would, would probably actually agree with that. But this would be the second split in the stock's history. It, it, had a two for one split back in 2007. So this would be the first one in 15 years. GameStop didn't specify in the SEC filing the ratio by which it intends to split its stock if the measure is approved by shareholders at the next annual meeting. But the company did say the increase to its share count would provide flexibility for future corporate needs. GameStop also plans to seek shareholder approval for a new incentive plan that it says will support future compensatory equity issuances. So whether or not you believe that a, a stock should rally even on stock splits, uh, it's notable because oftentimes GameStop moves for no reason that we can really uh, pinpoint. So at least there's, there's a reason here. And I should note that AMC up 3% in pre-market trading as well. So reigniting that meme stock uh, frenzy, I suppose. Okay, it is fun. I, I'm being a little cynical, too cynical here for a 40-degree uh, Friday in Chicago. It's not dumb. It's just uh, <laughs> bizarre. Uh, not exactly the list, uh, uh, I would think, uh, with the top five and then GameStop. All right, uh, appreciate it, guys. A good start here. Alex Coffey, Caroline Woods, thanks a lot. I'm going to talk some charts here with Ben Lichtenstein joining me in studio, and that means the 10-year is where we go back. I think, Ben, first place we need to start is that bond market's on the move this morning. Yeah, it sure is, Oliver. And uh, for the most part this morning, the number has been a little bit shrugged off. But uh, Yeah, I'd agree. The bonds are on the move this morning. The number got shrugged off a little bit. But uh, take a look specifically at the shorter end. I've got the two-year, the five-year treasuries on the move. Now, what's interesting... <coughs> There's those hikes. Me. That's what Alex is talking about is this comes with uh, Oliver, treasuries to the downside, rates to the upside, with the indices at a key 
juncture at this point, retesting those Feb highs and actually starting to roll over at key resistance. Some not only key psychological levels, you've got the NASDAQ around the 15,000 level, you've got the ES up to again 4,600, and ultimately the Russell to 2,100 and the Dow at 35,000, Oliver. But here, look, this has been the headwind that's been created uh, for the indices basically since the beginning of January. We can see how rates started to firm up and rally throughout last fall and throughout the beginning of this year. Now, again, the TNX not as much on the move today in terms of what we're close we've seen. though. I mean, it's I mean, we've had 1% down days in the future. So maybe we could get that high for 10 year yield today if it really starts jamming. If this takes out those highs, Oliver, I would expect to see those uh, headwinds for the indices continue to play out. All four of the majors still holding on to positive territory right now. But again, you really see the impact that rates have. Now, again, as I mentioned, it's more the two, the five that I'm seeing. They actually, on the number, took out the overnight session lows, the bonds and the 10-year the futures contract have yet to take out overnight session lows, but it does seem like they're rolling over again after Treasuries rallied off the March lows into the end of the quarter. Uh, again, again, with the Treasuries starting to roll back over again, that would mean rates on the rise as we're seeing here. The TNX about 4.5%. Okay, all right, so uh, we gotta get above 2.5 to get that high. Maybe it doesn't happen today, but uh, the bond market's uh, not going to stay uh, up in yield, uh, up in price and down in yield for very long. That seems like the message here. If you're going to get a constant employment data like we're getting, you know, every four days, basically, you get you know, at least one big print a week. Uh, so when you're getting these types of numbers, yields can't stay down for too long. Fed speakers uh, beating the drum for potentially 50 basis point rate hike come yeah. May. Oliver, we saw overnight. Maybe uh, 75, says Alex. Overnight, CPI uh, in Europe came in strong, again, really high. So it's not just here in the U.S. We're seeing this all over globally, ultimately. And this is what it comes down to, because as we've talked about, geopolitical tensions seem to be the focal point basically since the beginning of March, late February, that kind of came into play. But this was really the factors. The indices kind of derailed from those uh, beginning of Jan highs, the ES up around 4808. And this is the headwind that they've been dealing with. So again, that continues to come into play. And even this morning in the uh, jobs number, the month over month numbers, pretty tame in line with expectations. But year over year, they were really strong and there was an uptick there as well. So We've seen that play out. I think that'll continue to be the case as uh, some of the supply chain constraints continue. And then, hey, don't forget the COVID numbers that we've seen, uh, not necessarily here in the U.S., but globally have been on the rise again as of recent. And so yeah. uh, a concern to be considered China. as well. Yeah. And keep in mind, again, that ties directly into rates to the upside as well. But as mentioned here, also interesting, the unemployment rate tick down ticking to 3.6 was uh, a significant. That could give a little bit of a lift to rates as well, treasuries to the downside. Okay. So uh, we've got things to... Uh, be kind of concerned about on the no global question. picture with uh, Ukraine, with China's COVID situation. But here, domestically, this is driving the, the bus, uh, bonds and the economic recovery. Yeah, I mean, Fed Chair Jerome Powell and uh, Fed speakers in general have been really specific about how labor conditions are uh, one of the major focal points, but also one of the pillars of strength in terms of what they've been Absolutely. providing that backdrop. It's now, a great number. Uh, and also earnings this time around. Also, it was interesting to hear not a lot of CEOs talking too much about some of the inflation concerns that seem to be, for the most part, relatively tame there as well. So again, we're watching, uh, yeah. it seems like what we have been seeing play out continue to. Okay. Uh, bond yields on the move this morning. We'll see if it derails strength in stocks, but... So far, so good. Uh, Bitcoin's overnight weakness also is paring back a little bit. So you've got some dabbling in risk assets before the open. Still 12 minutes till the bell rings. When we come back, let's talk some more about these topics. And then stocks at the open. Stick around here on the TD Ameritrade Network on this Friday. Technical traders, the chart master is in the building. Trends, support and resistance, key patterns and technical indicators. The chart master has your live technical analysis throughout the trading day, only on the TD Ameritrade Network. Whether you're an experienced investor or just getting started, TD Ameritrade offers a webcast that's right for you. Looking to improve your portfolio management skills? Our portfolio management webcast series breaks down key concepts like retirement planning, income generation, ETFs, and more. Best of all, you can ask questions by chatting directly with an education coach. It's interactive learning at its finest. Tune in live or watch on demand. Head over to tdameritrade.com slash webcast and start learning today.
TD Ameritrade Network has arrived on the floor of the New York Stock Exchange, bringing you real-time market coverage and access to the biggest newsmakers on Wall Street. Don't miss Trading 360 and The Watchlist live from the New York Stock Exchange. Downloaded the TD Ameritrade mobile app. Yeah, actually, I'm taking one last look at my dashboard before we board. And you have Thinkorswim mobile? So I can finish analyzing the risk on this position. You two are all set. Choose the app that fits your investing style. Welcome back to Morning Trade Live. Nice uh, big employment print this morning in line with expectations. No big shocks on wages or anything to really uh, throw concern into the narrative of recovery. But bond yields are on the move. Uh, so far, stocks are okay with it, though. Joining us, Anique Sen is a head of global equities at Pine Bridge Investments. Anique, welcome to the program. Good morning. Good morning. How are you? I'm doing well. I'm watching the bond market wake back up again. Treasury is a rip in this morning. Uh, does that mean any problems for stocks, or have we gotten over that? I think we've largely gone over that. You know, we've been dealing with problems with uh, rising bond yields in stocks now since the start of the year. I think the more important driver here is demand. And, you know, U.S. nominal GDP growth is running at, uh, if you look at the latest print, the nominal number is plus 15 percent annualized year on year. Uh, actually, plus 15 percent the quarter on quarter annualized the year on year number is still very strong at plus 12 percent. So I think it's the growth outlook, the demand outlook. That is the key driver behind stocks right now rather than the valuation side. Mm. We've had a nice big rally off the lows. Does that uh, change the valuation trade-off at all? Up 17% in two weeks? Well, you know, the U.S. Uh, S&P 500 is still down here to date. Um, at the same time, you've seen positive earnings revisions. Um, you know, companies are talking about unprecedented pricing power. Um, you know, obviously, on a on a on a on a consumer price inflation side, on the CPI side, that's uh, something to be cautious about. Uh, but but the likelihood is that you will still continue to see positive earnings revisions, which is a very big support uh, for U.S. equities, particularly you know on the near term. Uh, what about the uh, the nature of those revisions skewing away from tech companies that did well the last couple of years and skewing towards? Uh, energy companies and industrial stocks. Uh, we've seen fertilizer makers going through the roof. Even a lot of the healthcare companies that were forgotten when the hospitals were uh, bogged down by COVID are starting to get some uh, good earnings revisions higher. What happens if the strength, though, shifts away from tech where the market cap is concentrated? Well, one of the big uh, you know, themes that we had at the start of uh, even, even last year, and particularly, I think, for non-U.S. stocks at the start of this year, is that the market breadth would improve. You know, obviously, we've had um, you know, the war in between now kind of um, you know, dampening a lot of the animal spirits, particularly on a CapEx side. But market breadth improvement, you know, particularly on the cyclical stocks, is something that we were uh, anticipating. And I think... Budgets for CapEx are still there, but my guess is that because of the global geopolitical uncertainty right now, um, those budgets are likely to be maintained, but the spending decisions are likely to be on pause. So I think you're right. I think it's going to be an improvement in market breadth. I think there's going to be a difference between what we would call short cycle industrials and long cycle industrials, where long cycle industrials are more those longer term infrastructure related projects like, for example, spending on data centers, spending on, you know, physical infrastructure, rewiring supply chains around the world. I think those kind of CapEx are still there, but some of the shorter cycle CapEx, more of the maintenance type, more of the, you know, shorter payback type CapEx, I think is going to be largely put on hold. Mm. Uh, shorter payback uh, CapEx. So walk, walk me through that. What do you mean by that? Well, you know, things like upgrades, things like, uh, you know, 
investment in you know shorter term automation productivity gains got it uh those kind of capex i think the market is is watching and waiting particularly as it relates to um you know the covid situation in china you know clearly there is a continuation of the supply bottlenecks uh because of the omicron wave that has hit china just in the last 10 days or so so i mm. think ceos and cfos are a little bit on a pause mode right now so that short cycle capex that you see uh maybe slowing a little bit i mean does that include emergency tech adoption by companies forced to work from home uh, there was a lot of fast uh, retooling of uh, workstations, the tech that was behind it, the cloud ability, all the this, the uh, video conferencing stuff, and we've seen the way the market has punished the really specific COVID uh, emergency trades. Does that continue, or have we worked through that uh, with some of those software companies? You know, I, I think that is uh, that's a that's an ongoing area of investment. I think the the nature of work. Uh, particularly in the service industries, has changed. You know, uh, my personal belief is that there are things you do better at home and there are things you do better in the office in terms of meeting face-to-face. -face. So I think that companies are uh, largely making those kind of investments. Uh, but I think the big side of, or, or the big part of that investment, I think, is now baked into those kind of stocks. Um, the sort of investment that I'm talking about in terms of capex are more the the longer term investments that i think companies are having to make particularly in terms of technology particularly in terms of um you know changing the concentration that we have in supply chains particularly towards asia a lot more onshoring i think those kind of capex are still in the pipeline uh but for the very near term this tension that we have geopolitically is likely to put capex on pause Okay. Generally speaking, I would say. So, uh, but, I mean, but on the other yeah. hand, I think you know this outlook that we have right now, particularly in terms of China starting to show growth, uh, there is a ton of uh, 